Good morning, friends. It's good to be here with you. My name is Father Matthew Buderbaugh. Back here with friends. I've been here many times, and so, uh, but never on a Sunday. So it's nice to see all of you. We'll begin our service of Holy Eucharist right to on the first page of your bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the Gloria, which is found on the next page. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you've taken away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may ha have the grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there but never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophecy to my people Israel. Um, Psalm 85. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. Truly his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will increase its increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet.
second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard the deeds of power for Jesus' name had not become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. For this reason, these powers at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her. Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please be seated. Well, as I said, it is good to be here <clears throat> with all of you fine folks at St. John the Divine here in Burlington. I know a few of you from various things around the diocese. I would say this is, I was going to say as I was driving here, that this is one of the few churches in the diocese I can find without GPS. And then as I was pondering that thought, I took a wrong turn. <laughs> and so here we are. There goes my uh, bit of ego that I had. <clears throat> but it is good to be here. I've been here many times. I've uh, mostly been on that half of the building uh, for various diocesan events and your Thanksgiving dinner. So it's nice to be back. You know, ever since I was small, I have heard something along the lines of, maybe you've heard this too, boy, we sure need praise music to attract the young people. Anyone else heard that one? Uh-huh. Maybe a few people have said it. I won't ask for hands. It's all right. Now, I got to tell you, when I was younger, despite hearing that all the time, I never really liked praise music. Not, not really. Um, I mean, it was fine for camp, you know, but... Uh, and now that I'm in my 40s, bald, getting little flecks of gray, I have a bad back, regular chiropractor, I, I don't know why, for some people, some reason, people in the church still think that I'm one of the young people, but we'll roll with that. But, you know, despite all that, every once in a while, people still think my demographic likes praise music. And still, I don't know anybody my age or an actual young person who does, who wouldn't prefer a wonderful organ and chant in church. I've often wondered about this sentiment. <clears throat> and I think underlying that notion behind this is that it would seem, at least from the outside, from certain metrics that our evangelical sisters and brothers may have been having more success than mainline churches. And so this idea became the narrative in the Episcopal Church since probably the 1970s. This narrative was Episcopalians must be doing something wrong and evangelicals must be doing something right. Maybe it's the music. Maybe it's the long sermon. Maybe I'll test that one out today. <laughs> Maybe it's the theological certainty. Who knows? But as long as I can remember, I have always felt like there was some competition and it always felt like somehow we were losing it. Well, this week, I don't know if any of you saw this, but Pew Research came out with a new study on demographics of American religion. Did anybody see this? Well, very interesting uh, findings. From 2016 to 2020, every religious group in America, including the nuns, not people in a habit, but N-O-N-E-S is in no religious, every religious group declined except one. And to everyone's surprise, it was white mainline Christians who not only didn't decline, but went from 13% of the American population to 16% of the population. Not only that, but for the first time since the 1970s, evangelicals have declined so much that they were out, that they are now outnumbered by mainline Christians. <clears throat> Now, this seems utterly shocking, considering the last 50 years of narrative that we have been told. I'm going to say a couple of things about this. Uh, I, before we start running a victory lap around the block, um, I'm not wearing the right kind of shoes for that one anyway. I'm going to say a couple of things about this study. Um, number one, 
The survey does an enormous injustice by not having studied demographics of people of color. It did, but it didn't study them in the same respect. And so a lot of the reporting is probably offset by all kinds of factors like uh, you know, population shifts, other religions, those kinds of things. But you can't really have this sort of study without looking at our, our African American, Hispanic American, Asian American, Native American populations. So that, that's a big, big caveat of a study like this. But the other really important point I want to mention here, <clears throat> when we talk about this, um, is that we're not exactly in competition with our sisters and brothers in Christ. And that's probably one of the harder things to remember. And I think that's part of that whole narrative that I've been hearing my whole life is this idea that somehow we're competing and somehow there are winners and losers instead of we're all doing this for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel. In fact, there's nothing wrong with being an evangelical as much as there's anything wrong with being a mainline as opposed to being a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox. We are all in this together. And in fact, as much as it pains me to say it, there's probably nothing wrong with praise music either. Just don't tell anyone I said that. No, you know, it's, these are about how we prefer things. But if we take a step back in all this, there is a lesson to be learned here. And that is, trends are trends, and God is constant. 50 or 100 years of demographic shifts and st statistics really mean very little compared to the 2,000 years of Christianity, or imagine this, the infinity of God. So much hand-wringing I have heard over my life and my ordained ministry over what is a parish's attendance or budget numbers. And yet, I wonder, is this really what God is asking of us? Is this what God is asking us? I don't think that is what God is asking us to pay attention to. God isn't asking us to go after the latest trend or gimmick. God is simply asking us, followers of Jesus Christ, to be faithful. Now, being faithful can also be a very scary notion. I mean, just ask Amos, or even worse, ask John the Baptist. We heard these two readings today. Rather disturbing, aren't they? I mean, here we have Amos, who's called out from dressing his sycamore trees to call out the kingdoms that supposedly are following God, but God is saying, hey, my people are wayward, just kind of like God's people today, us. Sometimes we go wayward too. It's not like that's new or old or whatever. I mean, we all, we all have to be called out sometimes. But Amos, that's a scary thing. Look at John the Baptist. Here, Herod thought he was, he saw Jesus and immediately he started getting concerned because he remembered he had John, the, he remembered this whole episode about John the Baptist and what happened to him. <clears throat> now, these are extreme examples, friends, of faithfulness. These are more extreme examples than hopefully and imaginably any of us are ever going to be called to. In the Old Testament, Amaziah said to Amos, Oh, see or go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. In other words, go take your truth telling somewhere else, would you? And here in the gospel, John had been telling Herod, and I actually I love this, by the way, that it says this little side note. Actually, Herod kind of enjoyed listening to him. So it's sort of funny that this is a bit of a side note. But 
John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias, now his wife, had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. And in fact, in the end, did. Is sometimes faithfulness has real consequences. But the point is that if the prophets and the saints and the martyrs can be faithful, sometimes in pretty extreme circumstances, we, you and me, can be faithful in whatever small thing we are called to. While it's not in today's reading, I'm reminded, as Jesus tells us in Luke 16, 10, whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. Amos and John the Baptist were truth tellers. They were honest in what they said, because they were called by God to be, but also they were called by God to be honest in who they were. We hear about John the Baptist in previous passages, and we hear he was living out in the wilderness wearing camel skin and eating locusts and wild honey. Amos tells us in this very passage, not a prophet. Well, turns out he was, but at least in his eyes, I'm not a prophet. I'm a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees. What these passages tell us is that no one is called to be something they are not. Now, we are called to sometimes be uncomfortable. That's the converse, and that's the hard part about it. And sometimes we're called to stretch ourselves. This is true. But we are also called to be authentic, to live in our own skin. We are called to be faithful, not for our own sake, not to be the next best thing, not to be popular, not to even fill the pews with folks who have heavy pockets. But we are called to be faithful solely to glorify God. And so when we pray, it is not for ourselves, although we do get something out of it, but when we pray, it is so that we can be connected to the divine. When we sing hymns, it's not because we like them, although we very well may like them. But we sing hymns to glorify our creator and redeemer. When we come to church, it is not so that we are filled, although we are, but it is to worship the Almighty in praise for what God has done. Our psalm today Psalm 85, verse 8, we began with those words, I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for he is speaking peace to his faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to him. God is constant, and we are called to be faithful. What fidelity is, is truth. It's truth to our God. It is truth to how God, who God made us to be. And it's truth to who God has called us to be. It is an authenticity in the deepest sense of our Christian calling. And it is for the sake of God's glory above all else. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> Let us now profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that it is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God for God, light for light, true God for true God, begotten not me, of my being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified in the conscious life. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world of God. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for your earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died and that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in the eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. For our parish concerns, we pray for the church. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Jeff, our bishop, Sandy and Becky, our wardens, Jessica, Phil, Connie, Jim, Deanna, and Pat, our vestry and clerk. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Episcopal Church in the Philippines. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Paul's Waterford. In our community, all the Burlington area churches, Love, Inc., the Transitional Living Center, the Women's Resource Center, our Diocesan Hospitality Center in Racine. For those suffering from war, natural disasters, or the economic crises in our world. For those who are our enemies. For those in the armed forces and especially those deployed. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Margaret Eisen and Glenn Johnson. For those celebrating birthdays, for those celebrating an anniversary, all those preparing for the birth of a child and for those celebrating the birth of a child, for those preparing for baptism and for those preparing for marriage, for those who are in need, John Ames, Jane Clothier, Don Cook, Marion Durkin Cook, Marilyn Johnson, Cindy Lawrence, Betty Lorenzi, Henry Lorenzi, Mary Nichols, Marilyn Nitka, Pidge Peters, Lana Ramsey, Estelle Serena, David Toretta, 
Jimmy and Tommy Yanni, and for those who have died. Let us pray for those suffering from natural disasters, domestic and foreign violence, and the pandemic and its effects. Let us pray for nations and peoples as they strive to do better. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church. And give to us that peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks to Christ. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia! Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I understand that this is the time in which there are community announcements. And if there are any, speak now or forever hold your peace. For those of you who have enjoyed these coverings that Pitch makes, uh, there are about a dozen or so in Healy Hall. I think she's trying to limit how much she has to box up to move it. It's to our benefit, so that's okay. <laughs> so certainly take up two or three of those and take them home and enjoy them. Uh, and bless her for those. Uh, whether you gather inside or outside today after service, we will once again be bringing along you know, some lemonade. You, of course, have to supply your own black of gin. Jeez. <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.